Monday, May 8th. And here are some of the stories we are covering. The UN Secretary General urges armed groups in the DRC to disarm and demobilize, although some say he's addressing the symptoms and not the root causes. It was indeed a passionate appeal by the Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Gutierrez, but I think he failed to address the root cause of the problem. He was only touching the symptoms. The DRC begins national mourning today, Monday, for hundreds of flood victims. The Ugandan police say the country has no gun violence problem following another high-profile assassination within a week. Renewed clashes in Sudan disrupt peace talks in Saudi Arabia. There are so many forces at work that the international community, if it's going to be effective, they absolutely have to be united on this. And at the end of the day, the two protagonists have to be willing to stop fighting. And UNICEF says it will take about 300 years to eliminate the practice of child marriage. Those stories plus Samson O'Malley sports are coming up on Daybreak Africa. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is calling on armed groups in the Democratic Republic of Congo to disarm and begin the demobilization and reintegration process. He spoke over the weekend in Bujumbura, Burundi, at the 11th high-level meeting of regional oversight mechanism of the peace, security, and cooperation framework for the Democratic Republic of Congo. Secretary General Gutierrez also urged political and community leaders in the region to put an end to hate speech and incitement to violence. John Mulimba is Uganda's State Minister for Regional Cooperation. He tells me that the Secretary General addressed only the symptoms of the problems in the DRC and not the real source of the problem. Mulimba says the root causes of the conflict in the DRC is the interference by what he calls imperialists who are arming the fighters and competing for the region's resources. I think the main message is signatory countries to the cooperation framework to cooperate and ensure that we amicably resolve this matter and also to urge uh, the partner states to respect the build-up of the processes that we have had followed through by the Rwanda process and also now later on the Addis process, which was also chaired by His Excellency Ramaphosa. That was the main message. So um, the U.N. Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez made a passionate plea to the various armed groups in the DRC to disarm. Why do you think uh, this has been difficult? After all, the East African community has a regional force in the DRC. It was indeed a passionate appeal by the Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Gutierrez, but I think he failed to address the root cause of the problem. He was only touching the symptoms. Because when you call upon the warring parties, silence guy, not calling upon those ones who are behind the curtains who are arming them, then that is treating the symptoms and not treating the cause. You see behind all this, the hand of imperialists, who are there, the ones who are inciting this violence. But I think the Secretary General also called on political and community leaders to end hate speech and incitement. And when you look at the conflict in the DRC, you mentioned imperialists, but it also comes down to Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, two governments. No, 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 no. Those are the actors that you cite here, but they're also being incited by others, the imperialists. And, and for us saying imperialists, that's not hate speech at all. We are simply saying the truth, talking about the truth. And uh, one of these days, I think people should refrain from hiding the truth. And that's why some of the problems are persistent. When you fail to address the root cause and you simply go cosmetic, you will then have a number of uh, bedroom meetings and you'll never solve the problem. Who do you see as some of the imperialists? Well, when we talk about imperialists, they are known. Without reciting, without going into details, they are known. You know who participated in the scrum and the partition of Africa. You know who have been behind the resource conflict in, in Africa. You know who are behind all these scams. You go to all these uh, mining areas. You don't just find there people who are fighting. No, behind there, there are people who are real actors, who are inciting, who are supplying these arms, who are supplying guns. The same situation is applying, is obtaining in Darfur. I mean, in uh, Sudan, you know, when you look at the wealth that is in Sudan, it's what is causing all this crisis. So you'll stop looking at the symptoms. Let's look at the root cause. John Mulimba is Uganda's state minister for regional cooperation. He was speaking with me from the capital, Kampala. 
The government of the Democratic Republic of Congo is today Monday morning. Hundreds of people who died after floods last week swept the eastern part of the country. Reporter Al Katanti, CBT Jaffa in eastern Congo, tells me that about 300 people were killed and property, including farmlands and schools, was destroyed. Hundreds of people have dead and many still missing in Calais after the drama. You know, this flooding was big one after a big rain, and uh, the region is under a mountain, so a big quantity of water came from the top of mountain and brought everything in its passage. There are different reports in terms of the casualties. What do you know about the number of people affected and what about the rescue operation and the search for the missing? We are talking about more than 300 bodies who have been founded and many people still missing because many families are reported missing persons. The problem is that the road from Goma to that area is not usable since the rain of Thursday in the afternoon. So the rescue operation is also slow because the rescue team had to come from Bukavu and another team uh, from Goma via the lake. And the first rescue team was volunteers from these villages who tried to do their best to rescue or to help some casualties. But many people are still reported missing and the government of DRC via the provincial government of South Kivu assisted the villagers. You know, this place in Nyamukubi, Bushushu, in the territory of Kalehe are very poor. It's in a rural area where they don't have many equipment, so the government of South Kivu assisted them to bury on the same day uh, the body because the government of South Kivu fed about the decomposition of the body as there is no morgue in the region, no electricity, so they could not keep bodies long time. But rescue operations are still ongoing and those who are working in it are volunteers from those villages. And in Kinshasa, the government of DRC called all Congolese to observe a morning day, Monday, May 8th. Are the places that are affected, are they prone to flooding or this is an, a very unusual development? This situation is not new and it's not the first time that there is inundation or flooding in that region. I think three years or four years ago, there was another flooding which killed around 500 people and destroyed lands and farmers. And you know, in the rural area, people depend by their farms because all of them do agriculture. So this situation will impact the social life of population, not only because their house were destroyed, but also because of their farms who were being destroyed. And let me tell you that even some schools were reported being destroyed. So education will also be impacted negatively after this flooding. That was reporter Jaffa al Katanti Sibiti speaking with me from Goma, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. There were renewed clashes over the weekend in the conflict between Sudan's army and the Rapid Support Forces. This, despite a ceasefire and peace talks in Saudi Arabia. The U.S. encounter host Kara Castillo asked Ambassador Tibor Nash, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, and Ambassador Donna Booth, former Special Envoy for Sudan and South Sudan. Just who can exert leverage over the protagonist? General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, the commander of the Sudan Armed Forces, or General Himiti, commander of the Rapid Support Forces? We look at Sudan, and it really is literally the crossroads between the Middle East and Africa. So you have keen interest from the side of the Middle East and from the side of Africa. You mentioned United Nations, African Union, EGAD, then the Gulf Arabs, then you have the neighboring countries, then you have the Quad, the United States, the United Kingdom. There is literally a traffic jam of peace proposals. And whether that is productive or counterproductive, we'll see. Okay, maybe if every foreign minister in the world is calling up these two people, that 
that'll keep them on the phone so they can issue orders. But at this point, that's about the maximum extent of good that all of these peace proposals being independent of each other do. The world needs to, number one, show some unity. Who is going to engage with them? Who is going to send the message? It has to be the same message. And by the way, it can be in public giving one message and then doing wink, wink. Oh, by the way, yeah, we're saying that you have to stop fighting. But yes, a shipment of arms is on the way and it's going to land at this air base. So the regional countries have their interest. Interests. The regional countries are also greatly concerned about the instability spilling over into their borders. There are so many forces at work that the international community, if it's going to be effective, they absolutely have to be united on this. And at the end of the day, no matter how many international initiatives there are, the two protagonists have to be willing to stop fighting. Because until the two of them are willing to do it, as long as they have their hands on weapons, as long as they're being financed, as long as they're getting tremendous pressure from their own constituents, constituencies because of their economic interests. The fighting is going to go on and countries are going to issue statement after statement after statement, kind of like with the Northern Ethiopia war, and nothing is going to happen until they're exhausted. So Ambassador Booth, Ambassador Nash talked about a traffic jam of peace proposals. That is simply, you know, not enough. The various parties need to show unity. But my fear is, and I'd like to get your take on this, is that we're looking at, as Ambassador Naj said, just a real mishmash of interest the Gulf Arabs, the African Union, etc. And I have a funny feeling that a transition to democratic rule is not a high priority for Saudi Arabia, for the UAE, or for Egypt. Correct me if I'm wrong. And that's what I'm concerned about. What will it take for them to come to at least some consensus on stability? You just hit the key word, which is stability. When I started back in 2019, trying to bring parties together in Sudan, it was the region and everybody in the region, the Egyptians, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Qataris, EGAD, uh, the African Union, they all wanted stability in Sudan. They do not have stability now, that's for sure. They will have even less stability if this war metastasizes, spills over into other countries, becomes an entrenched ethnic-based civil war. So I think everybody's interest in stability is what we need to build on, and which I believe the United States is working on right now, which is trying to bring the various components together. There's two ways you can go about this. You can try to get everybody beforehand to say, let's all get behind one proposed mediator and then kind of tell the Sudanese they have to work with that. Or we can say, here, everybody is out there offering mediation. Let the Sudanese decide who they will actually sit down with and then get behind that. And I think that second scenario is the more likely one to play out. But it's absolutely important that there be unity of the key players. And there, I think it's the Gulf states and Egypt and the United States can really play that facilitative role. Former U.S. Ambassadors Tibor Nash and Donna Booth on how to break the deadlock in Sudan, speaking with Encounter host Cara Castillo. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I'm James Butt in Washington. Today is Monday, May 8. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Still to come on our program, Samson O'Malley Sports. Uganda's Assistant Superintendent of Police, Luke Owishigiri, says the country does not have a problem with gun violence. His comment follows a high-profile assassination in about a week. Popular Ugandan blogger Ibrahim Tusubira, also known as Isma Olaxis, was shot and killed over the weekend closer to his home in the suburb of the capital, Kampala. On May 2nd, State Minister for Labor, Employment and Industrial Relations, Charles Okello, Angola was assassinated by his own bodyguard, who later killed himself. Owitigiri, who is also deputy spokesperson for the Kampala Metropolitan Police, says, says the police are vigorously investigating blogger Tusibira's killer. At about 9 p.m. in the evening, we registered an incident in uh, Chisasi Central Zone, uh, that is in uh, Kampala, uh, where uh, Ibrahim Tusibira, a blogger commonly known as uh, Isma Olaxis, and also goes by the name of Jaja Ishuri, who was uh, gunned down while he was in his motor vehicle, 50 meters away uh, from his home. We later on ascertained that he wasn't alone in the vehicle, he was with a driver, that is uh, Matthias, 
Waswa, uh, who survived with no injuries. We understand the gunman was one. From the statements we've recorded, he was waiting uh, for them to approach uh, the scene where he carried out his act and uh, later on moved away on foot. Uh, of course, by the time the police responded at the scene, he was nowhere to be seen, but efforts are on to track him down. Following up with evidence that will be provided from the CCTV footages. So this is the latest high-profile assassination in Uganda. I am talking about the assassination also of the Minister of Labor, Employment and uh, Industrial Relations, Charles Okello Angola. So what can you tell us also in the investigation of uh, Okello Angola's assassination? Well, on the assassination of Charles Okello Angola, investigations are still ongoing on that side. Uh, we all know that uh, it was uh, his uh, bodyguard, Private uh, Wilson Sabiti, who uh, opened fire at uh, his uh, ADC and uh, later on to the principal, uh, the minister, Charles Angola. The investigation, of course, uh, is supposed to center on the motive of this act. We all know that the gunman himself also took his own life in a hope of suicide. We don't know what motivated him to do that since the only witness and uh, suspect to the matter is dead. You are the police of Uganda. Um, what can you tell, say, an ordinary Ugandan who might be wondering, does Uganda have a gun violence issue? An ordinary Ugandan uh, uh, should know that uh, the police and other security agencies are trying as much as possible to have answers for this act that happened. We have part of the answer on the incident that happened to the minister, given that the, uh, the fact that it was the bodyguard that did it and later on took his own life. But we don't have the motive, uh, but we need answers to what exactly happened uh, yesterday, the assassination on uh, uh, blogger Ibrahim Tusuvira. So that is what the police is working on, uh, making sure that uh, the information uh, around that camp becomes available. And uh, of course, we shall be updating the public that uh, we don't have an issue to do with gun violence. Most of the incidents were, the, especially the incident that happened on Monday, they have a background. And uh, it was not an isolated uh, kind of uh, shooting where the shooter goes or goes around shooting aimlessly or randomly. These are shootings that are targeted to particular people. So I don't think this is uh, gun violence. Luke Owistigiri is the assistant superintendent of police and deputy spokesperson for the Kampala Metropolitan Police. He was speaking with us from Kampala. A new report by UNICEF says it will take about 300 years to eliminate the practice of child marriage. That's well after the target 2030 set by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Still, some progress has been made. UNICEF says the percentage of women aged 20 to 24 who were married as children fell from 23% to 19% over the past 10 years. Nakali Maksu is UNICEF's senior advisor on child protection. She tells viewers Cara Van Dam that the number of child marriages is still the highest in South Asia, home of 45% of the world's child brides. But ongoing crises like armed conflicts and climate change-related disasters are expected to increase the numbers of child marriages, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. We know that in Africa today, and we can expect over the next few years, all the way through to 2030, 2015, is that because of the combination of increased um, population, because of conflict, because of climate change, and other crises that are taking place, sub-Saharan Africa is moving very fast to be the second you know, continent that's going to be as highly affected or you know, even more highly affected than South Asia. What can communities do to try to counteract that? Some of these communities, they really follow their traditions and cultures. And in their culture, it's not unusual at all for girls to be married at young age. So, yes, indeed, we've seen that the traditions, cultures um, and beliefs play a strong part. And of course, patriarchy and gender equality is really very much at the core of what's driving child marriage. 
But increasingly, I also want to say that issues, you know, as we've picked up in the report, such as just plain old poverty, um, the decisions that families have to make in terms of how they're going to survive are playing a significant role in terms of driving child marriage. And so the cases that we have, the cases that we will continue to have in terms of child marriage are very much driven, you know, by poverty. In terms of addressing social norms, um, UNICEF is doing a lot of work with religious leaders, with traditional leaders, with an increasing now with women's groups, feminist groups, who are really playing a key role in terms of, you know, challenging these beliefs, challenging these religions, these cultures, to be able to try and, and roll back those type of beliefs um, around child marriage and also just put more value in girls, which has not been there from before, except in terms of seeing a, a girl's value around the monetary factor that she can be able to bring to a family. When you talk about poverty, it's been a long time problem and things are only getting worse for a lot of communities. Talk a little bit about the bride price, how it works in countries, not just in Africa, but around the world. So, yeah, thanks. I mean, in Africa and in Asia, where we know, you know, there's a lot of issues in terms of bride price. We do see, you know, families making choices um, where girls are going to get married and they can be able to gain some sort of monetary value, you know, for the girls. For poor families, it it almost feels like a non-brainer that they can look at this as an option for them to be able to get some income into the family and to assist in terms of, you know, the costs or other expenses that the family has. That was Nakali Maksu, UNICEF Senior Advisor on Child Protection, co-author of a new report on child marriage. She was... Good Monday morning to you too, James. We begin the sports in Algeria, where the quarterfinal lineup for the CAF Under-17 Africa Cup of Nations is complete after the conclusion of the group phase on Sunday. A new champion will be crowned after Holders Cameroon crashed out at the group phase, finishing bottom of Group C with no point, and were slightly edged off the second best placed number three team by South Africa on the account of goals scored. Focus now shift to the last eight and what makes the quarterfinal duels more exciting is the fact that winners will be assured of earning a ticket to this year's FIFA World Cup. The biggest fixture in the last eight will be in Constantine on Wednesday when host Algeria will take on Morocco in what is anticipated to be a closely contested North African derby. Algeria finished second in Group A while Morocco topped Group B, which was based in Constantine. The first of the four quarterfinal fixtures will, however, be at the Nelson Mandela Stadium in Algiers, where Senegal, who topped Group A with a 100% record, will take on South Africa, who were one of the best two third-placed teams. On Thursday, Anaba will play host to the third quarterfinal, where two-time champions Mali will continue their hunt for a third title when they take on Congo. The order of the best two third-placed teams Mali had a perfect record in Group C, where they topped with a maximum two wins. In Algiers, the last quarterfinal duel will feature Group B runners-up Nigeria, who will go up against their fellow second-place finishers from Group C, Burkina Faso. In athletics, Africa 100 meters record holder Ferdinand Omanyala warmed up for the Kipkino Classic with yet another African record in the 150 meters at the Atlanta City Games, Georgia, United States of America, on Sunday. Omanyala finished third in 14.89 seconds behind the race winner and home athlete Noah Lies in 14.56 Ardent to his African 100 meters record of 9.77 seconds, attained at the 2020 edition of the Kip Kino Classic. And on to basketball. The eight teams for the 2023 Basketball African League playoff have been confirmed following the conclusion of the Nike Conference held in Cairo, Egypt. Cape Town Tigers secured the last spot for the playoffs after beating City Oilers of Uganda 80-70 on Saturday. The South African champions advanced to the playoffs for the second time in a row. Other Nike Conference teams heading to the next round include champions Petro de Luanda and Hockley of Egypt and Fevereavo de Biera of Mozambique. In table tennis news, Egyptians Hanna Goda and Omar Asar are the 2023 ITTF Africa Cup women's and men's single champions following scintillating displays at the Moy International Sports Center Kasarani Indoor Gymnasium in Nairobi, Kenya. That's it for this Monday's edition of Daybreak Africa Sports. I am Samson Omale in Abuja, Nigeria. It's back to you, James, in Washington. Thank you, Samson. Have a good Monday.